Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Search Podcast. So, um, continuing on our sort of COVID nineteen prep series, uh, I think we should probably talk about hemodynamics next, and I'll probably end up doing a two parter with hemodynamics and critical care right afterwards, or back to back. I'll see whether I cross the half hour threshold. Um, so, hemodynamics for me is is like a sort of blanket term that covers monitoring signs of shock and physiology to do with blood vessels and cardiovascular systems and whatnot. And in one big um, blanket, right? Um, so I'm not an expert in physiology. I'm not an expert in intensive care medicine. And I'm not an expert in infectious disease. But I, I do enjoy and, ha- and, you know, I've spent a long time dealing with the acute care issues. In, in, in those sort of domains in addition to others. And uh, I would contend that there's no way I can turn you from a white belt to a black belt using this session. But, you know, I can definitely get you up there to blue belt level where blue belt is defined as somebody who can have some independent thought and some independent um, notion of, of what they need to know and, and how they need to address it. And our aims and objectives today are to just talk about shock in general and what the signs of symptoms are, pathophysiology, and the classification systems. But you can't talk about these things without talking about hemodynamics. Now, open any physiology textbook, and there are four factors that affect hemodynamic conditions. The first is the venous side, oftentimes referred to as the bathtub, uh, the ballast tank, the CVP, and the right atrium. They're different things, okay? But as a blanket term, or as, as a blanket notion, the venous side is congruent with the vascular or intravascular volume. By congruent, I mean it it is ratio to that and can be used as a surrogate marker for it. The best place to read about it is the Sheldon Magder papers. There's a series of three or four papers from about 10 years ago now that are really good at describing uh, venous volume, CVP, and mean systemic filling pressure, mean systemic and capillary pressure, and the difference and deliberate ideas in each, right? The next part of it is myocardial contractility and heart rate, which effectively are surrogate markers for cardiac output, and we tend to detect them with systolic diastolic blood pressure and the traditional rate, rhythm, cardiac, and volume, sorry, rate, rhythm, character, and volume that we see with pulses. Then you have the vasoactivity. So I would contend that vasoactivity is vasoconstriction and dilation at one level, but at another level, it's also probably and possibly your 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 ability to to recruit other parts of your system in a way. So I, I would say that that it's capillary leak as well, and I would say that all these things tend to help each other out and tend to 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 sort of act on each other and influence, and together they form what I would call hemodynamics, or or what I would define, or most textbooks would define as hemodynamics. Now, the concept of hemodynamics, or changes in blood, or changes in blood flow, uh, were probably first, uh, sorry if my phone rings again, it's just that I'm on call, um, and, you know, gets a little bit busy, so... Hemodynamics probably started around about the time of the pharaohs. And at the time of the pharaohs, medicine was a subspecialty in being a priest. And there are multiple passages in which they describe pulses, um, feelings, temperature. And one of them is this. And that was probably the first mention of pulse was in the priest of uh, Sekhmet's um, uh, scriptures from the Old Kingdom around about 3000 BC, where he says... His fingers on the head, on the hands, and the fingers of the back of the head, presuming carotid, upon the two hands, upon the pulse, upon the two feet, he measures the heart, because the vessels are on the back of the head and in the pulse, where the pulse is defined as the direct link between cardiac activity and life, because it says, because its pulsation is in every vessel of every member, and you know, that's probably the first time that we had some notion that life, heart rate, or heart activity, and pulse are linked to each other. From then, we developed the EKG, which, of course, gave us more insight. 
EKGs were tried on dogs because we thought that we were sucking electricity out of things. Turns out that we weren't. We were just getting wasted energy or emanating electricity and conduction. From there, we also have non-invasive blood pressure uh, monitoring techniques that added to our knowledge base. So we weren't just looking at heart rates and dysrhythmias, but we are now looking at or inflection, deflection, and problems with conduction electrophysiology, but we're now looking at how that affects cardiac output. It took a bunch of uh, physiologists being brought to the bedside for us to develop invasive monitoring of both the arterial and the venous side. And when you couple those with electrical conduction, you get a much bigger picture. And when you couple that with inspiration and expiration and an expiratory pause, you now have other indicators that we can use as clinical triggers. For example, fluid responsiveness with pulse rate variability and variability over the inspiratory pause or changes in blood pressure with a leg raise test, for example. We also have correlation between the CVP, its presence, its absence, and changes to it and certain valvopathies, as well as changes to EKG and how they correlate with both the CVP and the blood pressure as well as changes to the character and the waveform of the systolic and diastolic that may also pertain to different pathologies. And from there, we develop concepts of shock. Now, initially, shock was thought of as a momentary pause in the act of death. John Collins Warren was quoted in multiple texts as saying that. From there, Samuel D. Gross said that it was the root unhinging of the machinery of life. Up till that point, the only thing that we can do about shock is call the priest. But from there, because of all the advances in physiology, etc., and bringing physiology to the bedside, we developed the notion that shock involves the heart and the areas around the heart, and how to correct them, and if you can correct them. Now, by and large, the 1930s was a time when bloodletting to treat congestive heart failure and MI was considered a good thing. And we had divided myocardial dysfunction into high cardiac output myocardial dysfunction and low cardiac output myocardial dysfunction. How this was determined different issue entirely. But basically, we were either increasing the fluid or decreasing the fluid to try and keep the heart going. Needless to say, things had improved in some cases in some types of pathology, but having the heart be the center of the world is like be having the earth be the center of the universe. As true as we would like it to be, it's, it's not true. So it's not the right thing to think to use. We then moved on to classifying shock based on where it was happening and where we detected it. So hypovolemic shock was considered in causes like dehydration and hemorrhagic shock. Cardiogenic shock was due to an MI, arrhythmic disturbances, malignant arrhythmias. Distributive shock was considered in sepsis, anaphylaxis, neurogenic, adrenal insufficiency, and liver function problems. Anything that affected the neuroendocrine, the neuroendocrine uh, axis Obstructive shock was considered in tamponade, pulmonary emboli, and pulmonary uh, and tension pneumothoraces. And that wasn't enough, because around about the 1960s, we also figured out that shock affected different organs at different rates and exhibited different signs that may not be directly linked to blood pressure or heart rate. And that's sort of when you had the central nervous system signs of shock as opposed to neurogenic shocks with agitation LOC, peripheral perfusion signs of shock, like capillary refill, color and temperature, cardiovascular system problems, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and ischemia being an issue, renal systems, such as urinary output problems and creatinine, and then the gastrointestinal system with ileus and feed intolerance. So from there, we sort of recognize that looking at the cardiac monitor is not enough. It may sound intuitive now, Actually, in some centers, they still kind of say the patients are okay, even with a lactate of nine, because their blood pressure is normal, but we're not going to talk about that today. You know, it, it, I would like to think that we don't do that, but we do sometimes, Lord help me. And it's just that we now recognize that low urine output cannot be ignored. Lactate cannot be ignored. Capillary refill cannot be ignored. And that process started in the 1960s. In the 70s, we saw the biggest change to the resolution of the data that we had with the Swangans catheter. So Swangans did two things. First, it made us really good at putting in central lines. Second, it gave us measured and calculated numbers. Now the significance of calculated numbers is the Swangans units, those big hunky machines from back in the day, were the first machines to have a computer inside. This was the first time 
the ICU had to have computers strapped to patients. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, but it was a big step forward technologically because it meant that the FDA had to approve certain technologies, but it also meant that we had numbers that we never thought of before. And we could map the whole cardiac cycle. We had the peripheral vascular resistance index, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance index, so we could measure the PAP, the PA, the mean arterial pressure, left ventricular pressure, cardiac index, cardiac volume, CVP, stroke volume index, we could measure and ratio the cardiac output to the surface area. We had everything. We could measure the whole cardiac cycle from A to Z. And yet still, we had the same problems with the mortality. Now, why was that? The first reason was probably because there was a learning curve and we didn't have that many pharmacological agents to throw at it. But the second was probably the fact that the numbers were very confusing. If you gave me that printout while a patient was crashing, I might not know what to do with it necessarily, you know? And that may be the reason why blood gases had a mortality benefit, whereas swan gans didn't. There was a learning curve attached to them, right? Now, in the 1980s, we start to see a lot more animal modeling being done for sepsis and septic shock. And that gave us an idea that it was a mitochondrial dysfunction. It was a mismatch between anaerobic and aerobic metabolism that led to a sudden offset of sort of lactate rises and, and ergodogen perfusion problems. And, and that led to an overall acidotic situation that may not be compatible with life at a end organ level. And it was first manifest in, 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 at a tissue level. And, and local tissue hypoxia, which in a healthy person would lead to increased delivery. But when you just don't have anything to deliver, leads to more and more um, anaerobic uh, metabolism. Well, not really anaerobic metabolism, more like deranged metabolism due to local tissue hypoxia and hypoxemia that leads to a rise in lactate as a surrogate marker for what is an end cellular acidosis that leads to a serum acidosis that leads to an end organ acidosis and multi-organ failure. And so now in the modern era, we tend to think of shock as an acute insult at a metabolic immune and cardiovascular level or respiratory level with impaired homeostasis, a perfusion demand mismatch, and eventual end organ compromise. And using that definition, we've sort of started to be able to use our blood gases as not a biochemical marker, but as a diagnostic marker that reflects end cellular problems as you can see. And I'm going to do a whole day on blood gases, but you know, that was probably made more significant as, as a treatment modality or as, a, as an intention to treat investigation that you could do at the bedside, simply because of the fact that we could interpret it and we understood it at both a cellular and end organ level. It also meant that we developed enough technology by the 2000s to be able to do ultrasounds at the bedside with an increasing rate of proficiency. And, you know, I would contend that if you're dealing with COVID patients, there should be a dedicated ultrasound for them because of the fact that there's a cardiac dysfunction, there's a respiratory dysfunction, and then there's an end organ dysfunction in these patients. But things like the RUSH protocol, which gives you a direct index of what parts of the body are involved in this type of shock by looking at left ventricular contractility, right ventricular strain, causes for tamponade, IVC variations, aortic dissection signs, aneurysms. Uh, you're looking at uh, Marsden's pouch, the aorta, the deep veins for any signs of massive DVT that could be indirect. You're looking for pneumothoraces. You're looking for free fluid in the abdomen. All of these things, you know, we weren't doing them enough before. And now that we understand that it's a multi-system approach, technology has been targeted towards that. And training has been targeted towards that. And we now have the ability to perform ultrasound correlated with our blood gas or biochemical findings and correlated with our clinical picture. And from the classical view of just seeing one part of the moon, we're using, by using a microscope, we're using a telescope now and we can see the whole moon. We understand where we are in this. And that led to early goal-directed therapy and a global approach early where we're treating the volume problem, we're treating the distributive problem, and we're treating the cardiogenic problem, as opposed to deciding on which one of these the problem is. And early goal-directed therapy, you know, you can say a lot about that trial. 
uh, the Manny Rivers trial, you can say a lot about why it worked and why it didn't. But you will have to admit that at some level, the, the benefits of the trial are that number one, protocolized care is now accepted. Number two, when we approach shock, we approach it with urgency. When we approach sepsis, we approach it with urgency. There's no dilly-dallying anymore. There's no thinking about things, right? And number three, and by thinking about things, I mean overthinking. I don't mean thinking. I think that logic is a very important thing. I just think that using thinking to avoid making a decision might be pathological in this circumstance and may not be a benefit. Uh, that's a much better way of putting it, I guess. And it also told us that you, you need to attack and, and literally attack septic shock from multiple points of view and from multiple angles. And so, you know, protocol-based therapy, uh, such as this is what the goal directed therapy was, the first version that was tried, with you addressing the oxygen exchange problem, using blood transfusions if needed for hematocrit that's less than 30, using vasoactive agents if your MAP is less than 65, uh, or mean arterial pressure is, uh, or, or systolic blood pressure is less than 90, and you're using crystalloid and colloid infusions for low CVP, and having those as target goals led to better outcomes, not because it was protocolized alone, that, but also because you were tackling the problem from multiple facets, and you were supporting the end organs while things were getting done. Now that we got that in place, and now that our knowledge base includes that, whether we compare uh, early goal directed therapy to physician's discretion, like ARISE or PROCESS, where early goal directed therapy was compared to a protocol involving lactate and things like that, versus physician's discretion or PROMISE, in all of those cases, we produced very similar outcomes because the whole premise is you're attacking on more than one front. You're recognizing the complexity of the problem. Like PROCESS tends to involve um, the use of peripheral lines as well as central lines, different uh, blood pressure targets and a shock index. And their outcomes were the same as the uh, Merrick chest protocol, which uh, looked at the use of cardiac index versus left ventricular function on echo versus other monitoring dynamics. And again, we were looking at the same thing, whether you were using bedside echo or otherwise, you were still getting comparable outcomes. And so I would contend that the main benefit of all of these protocols is that we're attacking on more than one front. So we're looking at the, car at the nervous system, trying to control pain and delirium, being aware that sedation might be an issue and comfort has to be there for patients to lower their, their metabolic demands. We're looking at the cardiovascular system, trying to support it in any way that we can, maintaining an adequate flow ba balance. And I do mean adequate. I don't mean filling the tank. I don't mean giving boluses blindly. I mean adequate. We're looking at the respiratory system, trying to maintain some form of oxygenation that's also adequate, not hyper or hypooxygenating. Uh, we're looking at the GI system, make sure that we feed early, we reduce uh, the chances of bacterial transmigration. We're uh, starting renal replacement therapy appropriately. We're using plasmapheresis appropriately. And we're dealing with the infectious disease component just as urgently as we would anything that would have been labeled as a vital organ, such as the brain or the heart. We deal with these things on the same plane and we attack on different fronts. And that's why we're at a point where we can actually start to think about things like metabolic resuscitation and things that are happening at a microscopic level. And that's what's going to take us up to the next level, I think. It's understanding the HLH component, the hemophagocytotic lymphohistiocytosis component. When you have drunken macrophages, effectively, somewhere along the clinical response to sepsis, the controlled inflammatory response becomes a maladaptive response. And these are the criteria for it. And I think that this is probably going to be our next level. It's, it's looking at dedicated NK counts, soluble CD5, uh, CD25 counts, ferritin levels, hemophagocytotic ratios, uh, hypertriglyceridemias, cytopenias of sorts, splenomegaly, and fever. And even with COVID-19 patients, when you read the uh, Chinese handbook, they actually they have targeted tests like IL-6 for the indications for the use of steroids and things like that. And I think that, you know, it's very important to, to sort of take five minutes to look at the diagnostic criteria for HLH, 
just to get some some feeling for 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 it because I think that that's the next step that we're going to be targeting with sepsis in particular and possibly with other types of shock. Now a quick talk about uh, pressures and ionotropes. So we could go through uh, receptor interactions at blood level, blood a blood gas level. We could talk about uh, pH of activations, uh, myocytomembrane potentials, etc. But you'd be like this in five minutes, and this podcast wouldn't be as popular as I hope it will be eventually. Instead, I want you all to draw uh, a um, chart and make it look like this, with dilators on the top, pressors on the bottom, negative ionotropes on the left, and positive ionotropes on the right. And I want you to plot all the drugs that we use in the ICU. And that basically, that one slide, if you want to screenshot it, gives you a nice brief summary of what we use and how we use it. And if you look at it, norepinephrine is a bit more of a pressor, but it gives you some ionotropy. And that's why I would contend for COVID-19 patients, it will be a strong recommendation if it isn't already. Epinephrine, less of a peripheral, uh, um, a peripheral uh, vasopressor. One of the things that I haven't added is vasopressin because it's a bit more complicated. It certainly has more of an effect on splanchnic circulation, and its effects on the periphery are not extremely well studied. To I know that they're well studied, okay? And I know what a vasopressin receptor is. But it's a bit more complicated than me plotting it on there because I think that it has a negative ionotrope effect and I'm trying to prove it. Uh, but that's just between you and me. If you're looking for the ultimate vasopressor, it's angiotensin. And yes, it is available. It is available. Uh, but it it's, has an FDA warning slapped on it. And although it does lower your vasopressor uh, requirements or noradrenaline equivalents very quickly, and you can give it as a steady dose, what people have found is that it has they have safety concerns, A, and B, um, it rises just like everybody else does, and there, there doesn't seem to be a strong mortality benefit. But bear in mind that the jury's still out, and there is the uh, ATHOS-3 trial that I'm waiting to conclude and give us a result on. Um, I believe that it should have concluded by now. I just haven't had the time to check it. If you do know the results, then please let me know. So in summary, relax. It's not very complicated, all right? If I were to summarize things, at the bedside, you have capillary refill, lactate, and base deficit, as well as pH. If your pH is 6.9 or above, no vasopressor is going to work. This is an impending CPR situation, and it would be one of the few times that I would, and you can destroy me for saying this, start a bicarb drip in order to make patients vasopressor sensitive. An echo will tell you a lot about what the heart's doing, and whether to use more of an ionotrope or a chronotrope, urine output will tell you how you're doing during a shift, as opposed to during the minutes. Norepinephrine should be your go-to drug in most types of shock, outside of hemorrhagic shock, in which case it's blood, obviously, and cardiogenic, in which case an echo will tell you what to do, I would think. And uh, vasopressin can be used as second-line therapy in Europe, more so than dobutamine, and I think that in COVID-19, Given the um, angiotensin inhibiting aspect that seems to be discussed uh, a lot in non-peer-reviewed literature, if you have something that's blocking angiotensin to that extent, dobutamine is not going to be a good idea. It's going to be probably more arrhythmogenic and vasopressin will have to be used because vasopressin will also take the edge off your heart strain to an extent. And obviously the use of a central venous line and an heart line are strongly advocated for. Thank you for listening. Uh, sorry if it was a lot. Um, I tend to drone sometimes. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things that I find very interesting, though. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, and please subscribe. And stay tuned for our next episode, in which I think I'm probably going to talk about the various guidelines that are out there and what the differences are between them. And it will be related directly towards COVID-19, I think. Thank you, and uh, have a good day.